Well, good morning, Freedom House. Good to have you here. We also want to welcome all of our live streamers from California, Connecticut, D.C., Florida, Georgia, Minnesota, New York, North Carolina. What are you doing? North Carolina, you should be here. <laughs> Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Uganda, Africa. Now you can, come on, let's give them a big, big God bless you. So glad you decided to join us, and make sure if you're ever in Charlotte, make sure you come around and, and hang out with you. So my name is Troy Maxwell. I am the senior pastor here. Been away for a couple weeks. Thank you for your prayers. My wife and I, we celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, and it was a blast. We had a good time, two weeks away. Um, we're starting a new series today, but I want, I want to tell you a story. The title of the series is called No Fly Zone. They wanted me to be in that video, but I was out of town. Um, man, that video will fire you up. Won't you want it? That's a great, great video. Um, I, I want to tell you a story about my first time ever flying. I was about 25, 26, 27 years old. And uh, as you may know, my family, we, we grew up pretty poor. So traveling most of the time, you know, it was kind of out of the question, maybe a car ride here and there a few hours away. And so uh, when, I when I was in college, after I graduated from college, I met a buddy by the name of Farrell and Farrell was learning how to fly. And I'd never been on a plane. He knew I'd never been on a plane. And so he was doing his lessons and he said, hey, Troy, why don't you come and fly with me one day? And I'm like, sure, it'd be a great opportunity to get on a plane for the first time. You know, he is learning, but I'm sure he's going to have somebody with him and all that good stuff. And so I show up early on a Tuesday morning, beautiful Richmond sky, not a cloud in the sky. And so we get in this little four-seater Cessna, which is a one-engine plane. And we jump in and we take off. And he's got a, he's got a guy, his instructor's with him. His name is Dan. And we're flying along, and I've got that headphone on, you know, and I'm just chilling, just real. It's easy, not a lot of turbulence, nothing going on. We're, you know, a few thousand feet in there. We're headed to this little field so Farrell can practice landings. I was a little nervous, you know, about the landing stuff because he was a little shaky on the takeoff. But he turns back to me and he goes, hey, Troy, you enjoying yourself? And I said, yeah. And he turns to his instructor and he says, hey, Dan, this is Troy's first time ever in a plane. Big mistake. He turns, Dan turns and looks at me and he goes, oh, really? He grabs the yoke and turns the plane diving straight down like this. Okay, straight down. Okay, that's not the end of the story. Then, then he was going straight down and, and then he pulls it back up and I see him and he's just kind of laughing a little bit, you know, and I'm freaking out, you know, I, I'm, I've gone to the bathroom in my pants already and and we go down and then we go straight up in the air. So he goes down like that. He goes straight up in the air and the plane stalls. The engine completely cuts off and he's just smiling. You know? <laughs> and I'm going, oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus, save me. You know, I'm, I'm, my, I'm floating in the air, okay, because uh, my seatbelt's loose. I'm trying to reach my seatbelt. Then the plane just slowly falls like this back down like that. And then he turns it to the side and he, we're upside. So we're straight down up, now we're completely sideways and we're going like in this big turn like this way and then he levels it out and he goes, so how was that for your first flight? You know, and I'm throwing up and I mean, it's just horrible, horrible. First flight, first flight. We're, we're starting the series called No Fly Zone. That, that's by the way, a no fly zone for me. I will never get in a plane with an instructor ever again in my life, ever Again, what we want to do is we want to talk about that restricted airspace, that prohibited area that we as Christians should never get involved with. Now, I'm sure we're all familiar with restricted airspace, especially since uh, September 11th when, when all went down here in America and they have really increased the security in, in every airport and everywhere. Uh, but a no-fly zone is basically an area in which you're not allowed to fly unless you have specific permission. Well, when it comes to Christianity, there are certain areas that you should just stay away from. And, and, you need, and, and all of us need to know, we need a, a definition of what those areas are that destroy us, that, that cause us to get in a place where we should never find ourselves, that, that basically clip our wings. Because here's the truth. The truth of the matter is, is that God has designed you to fly. He's not, he's not designed you to survive. He wants you to thrive in your life. He, he wants you to be the head. He wants you to be above. He, he, that's his desire. It's like R. Kelly said, I, can, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. 
I spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. See me running through that open door. That's all I got for you today. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I believe I can fly. <laughs> that was worth coming to church right there, wasn't it? So what is your no-fly zone today? Today I want to talk about not flying alone. Not flying alone. Our culture is pushing us into a position of isolation. Uh, we, we hide behind our phones. We hide behind Facebook. We hide behind pictures that really aren't really us. We hide behind comments, you know, anonymously. We, we hide behind uh, different Twitter things. The, the, the world is pushing us. The enemy is pushing us into a position where we are isolated, separated. We don't, we don't need to have authentic relationship. I believe that we are in a moment in our history where we've got to be really careful that we don't distance ourselves in relationships. Look at your neighbor and say, don't fly alone. Don't fly alone. Look at your other neighbor and say, don't fly alone. If you're watching online, hit the you know, computer and go, don't fly alone. Record yourself, don't fly alone. Proverbs 18.1 says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. A man who isolates himself, who separates himself, seeks his own desire. Not only that, he rages against all wise judgment. It's dangerous to fly alone. Most accident, accidents happen in small engine planes when you're by yourself. You need a co-pilot. You need somebody with you. It's lonely to fly alone. Matter of fact, God said it this way in Genesis 2. He said, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. It's not good that you should be alone. Not, not just connecting with God, because I know that could be the answer. It's easy to say, well, you know, I got God. You know, I, I got Jesus living on the inside of me, but you need people. If you've been around this church any amount of time, we talk a lot about relationships because we believe in healthy relationships. We believe that you need people in your life to, even the people you don't like, they need to be in your world. That person at your office right now that's getting on your last nerve, God put them there for you. They are there on purpose to kind of, kind, of, kind of sand down that rough edge you have. And typically the people that we don't like, really we're just seeing ourselves in them. And so healthy relationships are extremely important. Relationships in general, I, lo I love what Gary Smalley said. He's a psychologist, a Christian psychologist, just focuses on relationships. He says, life is relationships, the rest is just details. We have a phrase that we say all the time, we're better together because we don't want you to fly alone. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to go to Mark chapter two with me. Mark chapter two, you can look on the screens, follow along, get your phone out, however you wanna do it. And I want you to look at this story of Jesus and th this little scenario that happens between him and, and the first small group in the New Testament. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, everybody say Capernaum. If you don't know much about Capernaum, Capernaum was the place that Jesus did most of his miracles. He felt at home in Capernaum. He, he felt at ease in Capernaum. You see, you see him do a lot of miracles, especially in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 9. He says when Jesus returned, he, he had left to Capernaum for a little while because he had healed this guy, this leper, and, and the le he told the leper, he said, don't tell anybody about me, but the leper decided to put it all over social media. And so everybody was coming out to find, wh who, who's this man? Who he, so Jesus had to leave because he didn't want them to try to put them in a place of a, a position. And so he returned to Capernaum several days later, and the news spread quickly that he was back home. Now, he wasn't in his house. He was in Peter's house. Most theologians believe that this was Peter's house. It says, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors because in that culture, you didn't close your door. You actually left the garage door open. You left your doors open because you wanted community to come. Kids would run through your house and, and take you know unleavened bread from your stove and steal your slippers and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, it was community was important. It was the dynamic of connecting with people was extremely important. So everybody left their doors open. Now, I don't recommend that today, but because people will steal stuff from you, but that's, I want you to get the idea of that, that, that you need to leave your heart open for the possibility of somebody coming into your life 
because they can, they can help change you. He was staying and it was so packed with visitors there was no room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. And they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. Everybody say the crowd. I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. So they dug a hole through the roof above Jesus' head. And then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Verse five, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were, bla- or who were sitting there thought to themselves, what, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat and walk. So I will prove to you that the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, I want you to read this with with me, verse 11, ready? One, two, three, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. Can we do that one more time? Because y'all sounded so good. Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. Just one more time, three. All right, ready? One, two, three. Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned on liquor, look, lookers. And then they were all amazed and praised God exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Now, th- this, first of all, l- let me just show you a little bit of contention here because we need to understand kind of the, what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to do several things with this story. The first is we recognize, and I had you say it, the crowd. We recognize that there's a crowd that's around Jesus. Now, I wanna challenge you today as believers to not be a part of the crowd. In my opinion, it's easy for a church, for Christians to become a part of the crowd. But if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the crowd never ever sought out Jesus. They just happened to be there at the right time. The crowd was came against Jesus often. The crowd was ambivalent to Jesus. They were many times in opposition to him. And we have to be careful that we don't become a crowd. We wanna be the church. In the New Testament, the church is defined as ecclesia. It's the Greek word ecclesia. The word ecclesia means an assembling, a gathering of people for the purpose of mission. It's not just a group of people that are just kind of wandering around from place to place. No, we have mission. You saw the story of Emmanuel who, think about it, 2008, that was nine years ago that he started eating a healthy meal, maybe the only meal he would get that week that was a solid nutritional meal. And then he finds Jesus. Why? Because an ecclesia in Charlotte, North Carolina decided to get a part of the mission of God to change someone that they may never meet until they get to heaven. Can I get an amen? The ecclesia, we wanna be a part of a group, uh, uh, not a crowd, a crowd, crowds are fickle. They're easily swayed. You find out in the Bible that crowds, uh, they they went away. Jesus went away from the crowd. Many times he would leave the crowd. He didn't wanna be a part of the crowd. He He would invest in a couple people as they came out of the crowd. Matter of fact, most of the miracles he did is when somebody pushed through a crowd or came out of a crowd. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? It said she had to press through the crowd. Some of you even feel like that in your life right now. You you feel like you're pushing through a crowd or you're in the middle of a crowd and today's your day where you come out and be a part of the church, the ecclesia, the mission that God has called us to. Crowds stand and observe while the four take action. They take action. They, 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 They move by faith. So don't fly Alone. Why? Why? Why why should we not fly alone? If you want to take some notes today, I want to give you a couple thoughts here. The first reason we don't fly alone is that we all go through mat moments. We all go through mat moments. It says in verse three, it says a paralyzed man on a mat. Now here's what we don't know about the man. We don't know how the man got paralyzed. We don't know anything about that. 
We don't know how long he was paralyzed. We don't know if it was an accident or he was born that way. More than likely, because he has four friends who want to get him to Jesus, more than likely, he probably grew up with these four guys. They hung out. We don't know if they're family of his. We don't know if they're brothers. We just hear four guys. We don't know their names. We don't know anything about them. They have a friend who's paralyzed that's on a mat. Maybe he fell. Maybe he got hurt. Maybe he was playing soccer one day with these four guys. They were on a team together and, and he fell and, and broke his back and now he's paralyzed. We don't know how long it's, it's been. If he, if he was paralyzed when he was eight, if he was 28, we don't know how old he is. We don't, we don't know if he's completely paralyzed or just partially paralyzed. What we do know is that he couldn't move. And you and I, when we go through mat moments, feel paralyzed, paralyzed. Paralyzed means we feel ineffective, indecisive. We're controlled by the circumstances. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I have, where I feel like I can't get anything done. I'm ineffective. I, I, am, I, I am immobilized. Paralyzed means you are immobilized. You are stuck. You feel like you are stuck in a job. Anybody with me here in this 1030 service? You, you feel like you're stuck right where you are. You're, you're stuck in a specific lifestyle. You're stuck in a specific socioeconomic situation. You're stuck in a relationship. You're stuck without a relationship. You are stuck. You, 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 you're stuck in mud. I don't know if you ever walked in mud, but you just can't even get your feet out of the mud, it's just so hard to even move. Every day, Monday, it feels like just, just can't get through anything. Tuesday, it's just even harder. And have you ever been in mud like me? You, you leave your shoes behind because they get stuck in the mud. Now you don't even got shoes on and you're stuck in the mud. And your mom's gonna get mad at you because those were your best shoes and you should have kept those shoes and you shouldn't have been playing in the mud in the first place paralyzed. Anybody with me today? You feel paralyzed. You feel immobilized. You feel ineffective. You feel unresponsive, deaf, and distracted, and just can't seem to get focus or unproductive. Can't get anything done. You just feel like that duck. You look good on the outside, but underneath you're just paddling away, but not going anywhere because the current of life is pushing you back. Ineffective unproductive, unfruitful. You feel powerless. I know I've been in situations like this where I've been paralyzed with a lack of confidence because something happened in my life that stole my confidence and now I'm paralyzed in insecurity where I don't feel like I can get anywhere. Anybody with me? You feel that way today. How about, how about you feel restrained and restricted David felt this way, King David. For 13 years, he was in a mat moment. Think about it. He gets anointed king. He's not the appointed king because Saul is the appointed king. God picked Saul. Saul's not doing a very good job, so God sends Samuel to David's house, and David is so thought well loved by his dad, he doesn't even invite him to the party. It's not very nice when your dad doesn't even invite you to the party. All the other brothers are there. He finally comes back into the house and he gets anointed. All his brothers are mad at him because he's the guy that got picked. David goes out and kills Goliath, thinking, you mean you think he kills Goliath when it's got to get better? I mean, he just had a huge success. So they start singing songs about him. David killed his thousands, ten thousands. Saul killed his thousands. And so his mentor, Saul, tried to kill him. 13 years tried to kill him. Let me read a, read a passage. It says this in 1 Samuel 18, 11. Suddenly saw through the spear thinking, I'll nail David to the wall. That's not a good day. <laughs> it, it's never a good day when your boss is throwing spears at you. I don't know what you've been going through in your office, but I doubt that you go in there on Monday morning and you're having to dodge spears. Come on, somebody. I mean, just like, whoo, shoom. Maybe, may, maybe those spears are accusation but they're not physical trying to kill you, Spears. And you feel paralyzed in your situation. We all go through mat moments. So when we are in a mat moment, here's the second thing I want you to get today is we all need someone to carry us, don't we? Four men, verse three, arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. 
thing I love about this story is that this guy had four friends who cared enough about him to get him to Jesus. Are you that kind of friend? When you go home today and you drive through your neighborhood, I wanna challenge you to look differently at your neighborhood. Maybe, maybe instead of looking at the neighbor who's always causing trouble and has got three cars in their front yard, maybe to see them as obviously there's something going on in his world. Maybe see through the eyes of God that you drive into a neighborhood where there's people that are all around you that are paralyzed. Maybe how about tomorrow morning, instead of going to work and, and looking at your job as just this grueling thing that you have to suffer through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and you gotta work 12 hours and you gotta do this report and you gotta turn this thing in as, as a mission field when you walk through the doors that you are walking through cubicles and cubicles of paralyzed people those that are in need of someone to carry them. Why is it that so many people live life without true, deep, meaningful relationships? You know why I think? It's because we fear being dropped. We fear being dropped. And typically, here's how it works. The reason why we fear being dropped is because we all were dropped at some point. Some of us were dropped as kids by our dad. Some of us were dropped in a relationship. We've been through a crazy divorce. And what tends to happen is we don't, instead of digging into deep relationships with the four, all we can think about is they might drop me again. They might hurt me again. It's like, it's like this guy in the Bible, his name is Mephibosheth. By the way, don't name your kid Mephibosheth if you're getting ready to have one. That'd be an awkward kindergarten moment. James, is James here? Here. David, David here? Here. Ricky, Ricky here? Here. Mephibosheth? <laughs> he's gonna feel like he's paralyzed. I mean, you just give him that name. <laughs> Mephibosheth was Saul's son's son. He was Jonathan's son. By the way, David, during his mat moments, for those 13 years is when he connected with Jonathan and they became the best of friends. It's in your mat moments where you find those deep, meaningful relationships. It's when you are paralyzed and you have to depend on someone to carry you is when you connect with people at a level. I'm challenging you today, church, to, to get outside of isolation and begin to connect with people, to be the church, to get into a small group. Mephibosheth, was Jonathan's son, and when Jonathan and Saul were killed, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter two, it says that the nurse picked up Mephibosheth and started to run out of the house in fear of David and his army coming in and killing them as well to get rid of all of Saul's kids. And in the rush out, She's carrying Mephibosheth. She's running out of the house and she drops Mephibosheth. And now Mephibosheth is lame. He can't walk. He, he, we, we, don't know, we don't know much about him other than the fact that he's lame. He, his feet have been deformed because he was dropped as a kid. And now many years later, David shows back up and he says to one of his servants, hey, hey is there anybody left of the household of Jonathan? because I wanna honor them, <laughs> which is kind of crazy to think that he wants to honor the family that tried to kill him for so long. But that's just how David was. He didn't have a fear of being dropped. He was able to get through it. See, in order to get over that fear, you have to trust. And it's not just trusting the people who are carrying you, it's trusting a God who will heal you if you get dropped again. Because I will promise you, you will probably get dropped again. You will, you will end up dropped again. You will end up hurt again. And I'm going to tell you, as a pastor who has seen a lot of people come through this door, these doors and a lot of people leave through these doors, it's easy to get so thick-skinned and thick-hearted that you don't ever want to get involved in a relationship. But I have decided I will risk being dropped for the purpose of helping people. Amen. And I want you to do the same thing. See, you have to risk being dropped to enjoy the benefits of being carried. Let me say that one more time. 
You have to risk being dropped to enjoy the benefits of being carried. See, when I, when I read this story, I see three levels of meaningful relationships here with these four guys. You see them progress. The first is when you get picked up. And I'm not talking about getting picked up at the club. I'm talking about if you fall down <laughs> in life and somebody reaches down and picks you up. And we all go through this. We all have those momentary mat moments where we fall down, we get hurt, we, something happens, we drop something, a life, and then somebody reaches down for just a short period of time. They reach down, pick us up. There's no connection. It's just kind of surface. Uh, not, not a whole lot of, uh, of relationship development there. We just get picked up. That's level one. Level two, however, is when we trust someone to carry us. So that's a little bit, little bit stronger. That's a, a season of life where I'm paralyzed and I can't do it on my own and I need you. But then there's the third level because see the four guys, when they came up to the house where Jesus was carrying their friend who was paralyzed, they couldn't get through the front door. The crowd held them back. They couldn't get through the window. The crowd filled it up. And so they looked around the corner and there was a ladder on the other side. And they said, what if we carry him up on top of the roof? Now, let me just tell you, it's one thing for you to carry me about two or three feet off the ground. It's a whole nother thing for you to take me up a ladder. This involves a whole different level. Now, I don't know if he could talk. We don't know if he was like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Why don't we wait till the crowd thins out a little bit before we attack that ladder? <laughs> but what we do know is these four guys decided to carry him up and he was willing to stay in the mat and to go a step farther, destroy someone else's property, put a hole in the roof, interrupt the whole church meeting. Just think about it. All of a sudden, <laughs> and then just somebody's lowered down. That's exactly what it sounded like. And just lowered down right in the middle of church. I mean, if it, was a, if it was a typical church, the demons, I mean, the deacons would run around and, and try to stop them. Simon, what are you doing interrupting the church meeting? I was right in the middle of a cigarette. But anyway, sorry, sorry, I have a momentary lapse right there. I messed up. <laughs> Come on, hit your neighbor, say, don't fly alone, don't fly alone. Hit your other neighbor, say, don't smoke, don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad right there. That was bad. But it was funny. That was funny. I don't care who you are, that's funny. That's the deepest level of relationships. The deepest level of trust is when we can be carried up a ladder. Carried up. Let me, let me ask you, who are you carrying? What corner of the mat are you on? Who in your life needs you? Have you identified that person? See, that, 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 that takes you out of the crowd. It's easy to blend in the crowd. It's whole different to grab a corner. See, that's what the church is about, man. This is a picture, a beautiful picture of what the church, because every day you and I have the opportunity to grab somebody's corner and help them meet Jesus, to push through all the religious junk that has gummed up the distance between where they are and where Jesus is. There is so much stuff that is in between and it's up to you and me to pick them up. And if it means I can't get them in, well, I'm not gonna give up, I'm gonna keep pushing around. See, this leads me to the third, the third thing is that, that we all need someone to believe in us, don't we? We all do, we all need someone to believe in us. Verse five, after they lowered them through the roof, it says, Jesus seen their faith. I love those three words, seen their faith. Wasn't the faith of the paralyzed man, it was the faith of the four. It was the faith of those four guys who decided against everything that I have heard. They heard that Jesus had done a miracle. They heard that he preached something that nobody else had ever preached before, that he had authority like nobody else. I mean, there was something about Jesus, something about this man 
who had healed a leper, who, who had, had preached, maybe, maybe even other miracles had happened and they'd heard about it. If I can just get him to him, if I can just get my friend to Jesus, we all need somebody like that. We all need somebody to believe in us when we don't believe in ourselves. Because I imagine this guy lost hope. I'm just gonna end up staying on the mat for the rest of my life. I guess this is what God has planned for me. I don't, I lost hope. Didn't have any opportunities anymore. I guess I'll just live in this house, this neighborhood for the rest of my life. I, I guess I'll just be out of work or I guess I'll just be in this job for the rest of my life. Let me tell you, sometimes we need one of the four to come and just smack us a little bit and go, there's more in you than you think is in you. I, I believe for you. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna step in between your unbelief and your lack of hope and believe for you. We need people in our world like that. We are to be those kind of people that point out the potential and never give up on them. Never give up on getting them to Jesus. They had persistent faith. Everybody say persistent faith. Persistent faith never sees obstacles, only opportunities. It was a determined faith. Nothing's gonna stop me from getting my friend to Jesus. Nothing's gonna stop me. I'm gonna keep asking you to go to church. I'm gonna keep asking you every week to go to church with me. Every Saturday night, I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna, because I know that this is the answer. I know you don't think so. And I'm every day, I'm gonna ask you every single time. Every time we go to lunch at work, I'm gonna ask you, hey, you should come to Authentic with me because you need to come to this women's conference. Why do I need to come to that? I just a bunch of women just crying all over themselves and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's nothing like it. I mean, it's, it's, it's the power of God. And you've been telling me for the last six months how your marriage is a wreck and how your kids are all jacked up. And you've been reading this self-help book and watching Oprah over and over again and the own network and this network and that network and, and getting all this done and, and up and down here and there. And what you need to do is let me pick up the corner of your mat and take you to Jesus. That's what, I, that's what you need to do. You need to let me help you meet the one who has the answer. Why? Because I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe that there is more in you than you even think is in you. That happens. I'm glad I got friends like that in my life that call me out on the carpet and say, Troy, what are you, why are you settling in what you're in right now? There is so much more for you. Why are you quitting here on this? You need to push yourself a little. Everybody needs a little coach on the side and just going, yes, you can do it. Come on, come on, you can do it. You can make it. You, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get through this. They had creative faith. Not only did they have persistent faith, they had creative faith. You, you, you know, it takes creativity to go, well, what if we take him up the ladder and then we broke a hole in the roof? Because somebody, when they came down, they're like, man, I should have thought of that. <laughs> they were the one of the one, ones in the crowd in the back and they could barely even see just the corner of Jesus. And they're like, why didn't I think about going up there? Because you didn't have creative faith. You didn't have persistent faith. We need friends in our life that have creative faith. And here's the last thing I want to tell you today is we all need to be forgiven. We all need to be forgiven. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Look at me for a second. Do you think his friends maybe were a little disappointed when he said that? I mean, think about it. They bring a paralyzed man to Jesus in hopes that he's gonna get healed and Jesus forgives his sins. I would be a little disappointed. Why did we bring him all this way? I could have just taken him to the temple to get his sins forgiven. I could have just taken him to the priest. See, but what they didn't know is that Jesus was getting to the root of what the paralysis was all about. And this is exactly what God does when we take people to him. We, we, we think we're taking them to Jesus for this reason when Jesus is gonna go three levels down and deal with the very thing. And you're, you're sitting in this room right now and, and you're probably maybe watching online right now and somebody told you about this church and, and you're watching it and you're going, oh my gosh, I thought that I was watching because of this, but Jesus is digging down two or three levels and going, your sins are forgiven. Because see, that was the issue. Sin will paralyze you. Sin will immobilize you. Sin will make your life unproductive. But I'm so thankful that we have a God 
who forgives us of our sins. The Bible declares that as far as the East is from the West, he remembers our sins no more. You know, and that's one of the hardest things I think for believers to understand is when we mess up and we all do, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. We all sin. If you don't sin, then just go ahead and let your wings sprout right now. Pull your halo out and fly on on to heaven. We all got problems. We all got stuff. And one of the hardest things in life is when we confess that sin is to realize it's gone. God even told us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So Jesus says to the man, he says, your sins are forgiven. And then he has this little discourse with the religious because the truth of the matter is this story was not so much about the man's paralysis as it was about the religious scribes and Pharisees paralysis. He talks to them for a little bit and he goes, listen, which is easier for me to do? Is it easier for me to to tell him his sin's forgiven or to stand up to get over this paralysis. And this is what I believe today is the prophetic word for you. So not only did he forgive his sins, which is powerful, but he also says, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. In other words, you're no longer paralyzed. The thing that has defined you For the last however many years, you can just roll it right back up and you can go and be all that God has called you to be. That's the prophetic word for you today. That's the word of the Lord for you in this room that you can, by faith, stand up. Matter of fact, we're gonna do it by faith. If you feel like your life, you are paralyzed, you are immobilized, you are ineffective, you are stuck in the mud, you are restrained and restricted, stand up, stand up, stand up right now. Stand up and say, I'm not gonna settle for this anymore. Stand up, stand up and say, I'm no longer gonna be paralyzed in my marriage. Stand up and say, I'm not gonna be paralyzed in my finances. Stand up, just stand up by faith right now, stand up. And just by faith, just feel like you're just rolling that mat up and say, I'm never going to lay on this mat again. I'm never going to use this as a crutch in my life. I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I'm not going to allow anything to to, to cause me to get back in that mat moment again and paralysis. And and I'm not going to live that way anymore. And I'm not stuck anymore. And I'm not ineffective. No, God, I'm the called of God. I am, I'm anointed by God. I'm going to stand up and be who God has called me to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give him some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lift both hands to heaven. We're going to make a confession today. Just say this out loud. Mean it with all your heart. Say, I am no longer paralyzed. I will stand up for you, Jesus. My sins are forgiven. I am free from shame. I am free from guilt. Thank you, Jesus, for sending people around me to lift me up, to present me before you. And today, I confess, I declare that I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. You are my provider, God. I am rich in you. I declare I will walk and not be weary. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give him some praise.